<sighs> really good to see you. Good to see you. Does it feel funny being in here? A little bit, yeah. I, um, I feel like I've known you forever, and to realize how much of a big piece of the story of you I was missing is brutal. Do you have a shorthand to describe what it is that happened to you? When I was 23 years old, I married a man who beat me. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I got out of that marriage within a year by my first anniversary. But what he left me with was not physical injury. It was the, what, it was the emotional and psychological pain that I took with me out of that marriage and kept with me for many, many years. But if you didn't know that about me, that's because I didn't want you to know, right? And that was part of it. There was a shame that has kind of trailed along after me, depending on what was going on in my life. We can all hide things. And when I'm in broadcast mode, this voice of mine has hidden my greatest secret. My name is Anna Maria Tremonti, and this is my story. When you started this podcast, there was no ending to this story. What did you want to happen? I really wanted to tell my story, though, to also kind of signal that this can happen to people who you don't think it can happen to. This can happen to people who you think are strong. And in fact, victims of intimate partner abuse mm -hmm. are strong from day one because they get up in the morning and they keep yep. living. And we don't realize, we don't give them credit for being as strong. We think they're weak, they're not. So can you tell us a story? You, as you say, married very young, 23. I look at myself now and I look at that picture of my elopement day and I think, what were you thinking? Hmm. It was a whirlwind. He was very sort of out there, very outgoing, spontaneous, fun-loving guy, but he would be moody. And the first time it happened, he'd been moody and I didn't understand why and I was trying to figure it out, like ask him. And I was trying to get him to talk to me and he just blew. And he threw a pot of coffee at me. And it wasn't that hot, but it, like the coffee hit me on my back because I turned. And then he started pummeling me with his fists on my back. And I didn't know what was happening. This had never happened to me before. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what to do. I kind of like hunched over. Mm -hmm. I probably asked him to stop. I don't even remember. But he just kept hitting me and hitting me. And when it ended, I remember going into the washroom and I could already see bruise marks. I could already see the marks on my back. And I remember thinking, wow, you bruised so easily. Like I really wasn't registering yet what he had done. And of course I don't bruise easily. I bruise when you hit me hard. <laughs> Did you wonder if other people knew? There was um, a Sunday that was particularly hard. It had started early afternoon. He was angry with me, he was punching me, yelling. I no doubt yelled back, but there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of hitting and punching and there was a knock on the door and there were two policemen there. Mm. And they wanted to come in. I wouldn't let them in. They told me, and they probably shouldn't have, they told me that my neighbor downstairs called them and they wanted to come in. They kept saying, can we come in? Uh, you know, where's your husband? And I'd say, he's sleeping upstairs. And well, are you okay? I'm fine. But I want them to go away. And I'm not happy that they're there. I thought that bitch downstairs. But that was the day. That was the day that somebody knew my secret. And what did that day change? Not a thing, Adrian, hmm. not a thing. It is as if he has taken whatever's inside of me and ripped it away. I have never felt such emptiness, such untethered unbeing. I look down and look up again and still see nothing, no one. It is a moment of non-existence. So at some point you left. What happened? What was the decider there? I didn't decide I had to go. He did. Mm. We had been in Ottawa and um, 
he had beaten me up. And then he left me there. He said, I'm going home. We had driven from Fredericton and he left me there. I decided I was going to take the train home and it was an overnight train. And I spent my time on that train saying, this has got to stop. I'm going to be a better wife. And I remember getting in to the house early in the morning. It was like between seven and eight. And he said hello to me. And I poured myself a coffee and I sat down from across from him a little closer than this. And he said, either you leave or I leave or I'm going to kill you. It's just a matter of time. Oh my God. <laughs> what do you do in that moment? I didn't know if I believed him. Hmm. I didn't know if he was capable of it. Because you didn't want to believe him or? I was so far down a rabbit hole. Hmm. It was days later that I had a job interview with CBC. And you know, Fredericton's a small place for <laughs> reporters. <laughs> and by this time, I'm in a guest house and I've got my stuff, but I gotta get dressed for this interview. And I've got fingerprints oh my on God. my neck. So I gotta figure out what to wear. They well, can't know that you're a battered wife because why? they won't hire you. They wouldn't hire you because you were a victim? Well, that's what I thought. You know, you know, that because to be a victim is to be blamed, right? So you get the job. I got the job. This is a city already devastated by war. You have the most extraordinary career. All these years later, did you bring this experience with you as well? Yes, I brought it with me, but I didn't let it overtake me. I mean, I look at my deep connection to the war in Bosnia. Hmm. I just always wanted to go back in. Like, send me back, send me back. But I think that I found something important in finding people who are in the midst of a trauma that is not of their making, that is not their fault, that they do not have control over, they're stuck in. Another displaced victim in a war which exacts its greatest toll on civilians. Were you also looking for someone who understood you? Were, were you looking to share this a bit and be less lonely in this experience? I think I was trying to, you no, know, it's a good way to put it, the loneliness of trauma. I think I was trying to help, I don't think I was trying to help myself. In the end, I was helping myself. Um, but I wasn't worried about my loneliness and trauma. Mm -hmm. Again, I felt that that was separate because you think you're alone. And I diminished my trauma because that trauma was much more acute, let's face it. I've spent my career confronting people with power, getting them to account for their actions. It's what I do. So of course I've got these questions and they're not going away. And that 23 year old in me who got sideswiped, she wants some answers. I, I'm not gonna give away what happens, but I do find it interesting that you really worked hard to go through accountability. Like you, intended to talk to him, right? You wanted answers and you went at it like, like Anna Maria Tremonti. Well, on a very intuitive journalistic level, you gotta hear from the person you're talking mm -hmm. about. I have wanted to not confront, but to have a conversation with him for a long time. And I've not known how to do it. And then the question is, well, what if he denies it? Hmm. What if he tells you you made it up? What if he says, this is how I remember and it's different? What if he says, well, yeah, but it was your fault. And navigating that is a lot. And it is a lot for a lot of victims. And a lot of victims don't even get to the point where they get to navigate it. And I do. And all these years later, what do you think of that bitch downstairs? I'm grateful for her. I never knew her name. Thank you for having the guts to open up about this. It's going to make a difference for a lot of people who will not see this coming.
Thank you. Thank you.